A Study of the Parables of Jesus, Lesson 13, The Parable of the Great Banquet. That's Luke 14, 15 through 24. I'll give you a moment to find that in your NIV New Testament. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go to see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I can't come. Another said, I, am, I just got married, and so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, said the servant, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go to the roads and the country lanes and make them come so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The background of this parable might be a little strange to us, but as we'll see, not as strange as you might think. The Palestinian upper classes in the first century used banquets to achieve their social, economic, and political purposes. Do you realize that if you call that banquet a dinner party, people in the same classes of people today use dinner parties to further their ends socially, politically, and economically. You may have attended some just like that. Jesus was often invited to dine at these banquets and dinner parties. He himself commented on the reputation he had among the Jewish leaders. Comparing his reputation with that of John, who practiced, and practiced an ascetic lifestyle, he said, the Son of Man came, he ate regular food and drink. This caused the people to say, he is a glutton and a drunk. And in addition, that he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's my translation of that passage. The literary background of this parable is the observations and comments which he made at one of these dinner parties which he attended on the Sabbath. Now, that's no violation of the Sabbath law because after you have attended on Friday night a Sabbath meeting, then the rest of the day, just so long as you didn't travel too far to get there, that you didn't do work to produce the banquet, you could have all the number of banquets you wanted. The Pharisees and those authorized to interpret the law were covertly watching him to see whether he would heal a man who was present. Jesus took the initiative and challenged them by saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Later in the banquet, he noticed how the guests had chosen the choice seats at the tables and chided them for it. Continuing on from there, and that's the reason this 
parable seems to start in the middle of a scene because it is in the middle of a scene. A whole lot has gone on before Jesus speaks this parable. He told them that he, they should not invite only their peers who could return the favor, but should also invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. The kinds of people that the Pharisees could not stand to have in their homes and socialize with. One of his fellow guests called out, God will bless the person who eats at the feast of the kingdom, the rule of God. Now, this was a standard thing. It means that the idea of the, a banquet being symbolic of the messianic kingdom was standard practice among the Jewish teachers, especially in the so-called intertestamental period. Now let's look at the meaning of this parable as a whole. The main theme of the parable is God's taking the kingdom, the rule, away from the Jews who confidently expected it to be theirs and giving it to the Gentiles. A secondary theme is the superficiality of the reasons given for refusing the host's invitation. While they would suffice to excuse a person from attending a regular social, ordinary invitation, they're completely inadequate to reject something as important as an invitation to participate in the kingdom of God. And that's the thing we need to realize as we apply this parable to ourselves. What would be socially acceptable is not a reason for not serving the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God first, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, and these other things will fall in line naturally. Let's look at the individual elements of this parable and see their meaning. The host is God, who invites first the Jews to enter his kingdom, his rule, then subsequent to their rejection of the invitation, invites the Gentiles. The notification that an important banquet was to be on their calendar is the teaching about the coming kingdom, rule of God, historically given from Deuteronomy through all the prophets. They should have recognized the appearance of the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus, and they had not. The invitation was given, Jesus gave it. In fact, he started preaching that the kingdom of God was here. That was the message, the content of the message, and they rejected it for their own private reasons. As mentioned above, their reasons for refusing the invitation were sufficient for ordinary social invitations, but were ludicrously inadequate for refusing an invitation to participate in the kingdom, the rule of God. The anger of the host is the response of God to the inexcusable rejection of the kingdom by his covenant people. The poor, the disfigured, the blind, the disabled, who are invited to take the place of these originally invited, are the Gentiles. Their description in these terms represent the way the Jews, especially the Jewish leaders, perceived them. They could not conceive of these messy, sinful, rejecting Gentiles 
ever being the people of God. The statement that not a single one of those who rejected the original invitation would enjoy the host's banquet points toward the completeness of the destruction of the Jewish nation in 66 to 70 AD. In closing, let's look at how you can make this parable your own. Make a list of this. Which are the reasons for refusing the invitation would you use in de declining an ordinary social invitation? I want you to do that so that you get in the mindset of, the, of this parable. Have you ever really stopped and considered yourself a grafted in Gentile believer? You know, the church is so overwhelmingly Gentile that we sometimes forget we're, I don't mean this literally, but we're second class citizens. We're not really because Paul's emphasis is that Jew and Gentile are equal in the kingdom. But we're, maybe Johnny come lately would be the phrase to use. And we need to be aware of that. That will improve our relationship with Jewish believers, which could stand a lot of improvement. Do you feel any special obligation toward non-believing Jews today? We ought to. That was one of Paul's basic teachings about the relationship between Jews and Gentiles, is that Gentile believers ought to make a special effort. Paul did. He went to the Jews first every time. Now we look at that and most of us just say, well, that was back then, but now there's no, it hasn't changed. They're still unbelieving Jews. And that means we ought to act in special ways, have special missions, special friendships to share the gospel with unbelieving Jews. And then finally, what obligations do you feel toward Jewish believers today? Do you ever look them up a Jewish believer? Do you ever make friends with a Jewish believer? Do you even know any Jewish believers? When you remember the parable of the great banquet, remember the Jews were invited first. Thank you.